Hi, I'm Ron. Welcome to the channel. One of the questions I get asked the most uh, by people who have not heard a lot of native flute or, or, or by people who are just learning to play is how do you make those chirping sounds at the ends of notes? Now, most of us call those chirps or barks. Stick around and I'll show you the basic technique for it. Even if you've been playing for years and years and years and use barks and chirps all the time, please stick around anyway because we're going to kind of do a deep dive into this and look for ways to bring more variety to our barks and chirps and uh, by doing so bring more expressiveness uh, to our music making. As always for these videos, I am using a medium A Native American style flute. This one is by Colin Peterson at woodlandvoices.com. Grab your favorite medium A and we will get started. Now, um, basic technique for making a bark or a chirp involves our breath, in particular our diaphragm, and it involves some fingers, usually fingers on the top hand. Uh, you might want to check out one of my breathing videos. Um, it, depending on what device you're, you're looking at, breathing for Native American flute playing might come up here or there will be a link in the description box, especially if you're not familiar with the term diaphragm. We'll talk, you know, you'll get an idea of what that is. Um, imagine just for a second that you're trying to make a, a puff to, to blow out a candle. <laughs> right, when you do that, you'll feel a muscle working down here in your tummy, right? That's your diaphragm muscle, and that's the muscle we want to engage to help out with barks and chirps. Usually barks and chirps are put at the ends of notes, and what happens is we'll be breathing along, continuing our note, and then when we want to add that bark or chirp at the end, we'll give a little push with the diaphragm. Boop, right? And at the same time, one or more of these fingers up on the top hand will come off the holes, right? And then we want to immediately stop the breath, either with the diaphragm or with the tongue or both. So steady air and then push and lift and stop that air, right? So it sounds like this. All right, I'm going to try to get up really close here so that you can see what my fingers are doing. You can use this finger or this finger or both, right? I'm going to use both this time. And you can hear that as soon as those fingers come up, I'm stopping with the sound. And I'm doing that with the diaphragm. And oftentimes, I'll use my tongue to stop the, the sound as well, just by bringing the tip of my tongue very quickly to the roof of my mouth or to the back of my top teeth. And that, that will help to stop the sound very abruptly, too. And that's really all there is to the basic technique of making a bark or a chirp. Listen to it one more time, and uh, again, I'll, I'll get up here a little bit close so you can see. You don't need to see the bottom fingers. They're not doing anything, but uh, you can check out the top fingers. So, again, the idea is we get to the end of our phrase, our note is sustaining breath, and then we push a little bit with the diaphragm, lift those fingers, and then stop the air right away. It's important to stop the air right away. Listen to what happens. I'm, I'm going to, to uh, try to do a bark, and I'm just going to lift this finger, but I'm going to forget, I'm going to forget to stop the air, and listen to what happens. Right now, we've just made a nice, elegant jump from a very low note to a very high note, and that's a cool effect, but that's not what we're after here. To make the bark sound, you've got to stop the air right away. And then you get that little pop instead of a sustained note. All right, practice that for a bit if you want. And then come on back and we'll try some other things. Uh, if you already know about barks and use them all the time, you can just stick around. Uh, and I'll have time codes down in the description box too, so you can kind of bounce around in the video as you, as you want or need. All right, if you've been uh, practicing your barks and chirps for a bit, 
and uh, still feel like you need a little more help, or if you get to the end of this video and feel like you'd like more help with anything that we talk about today, uh, maybe consider a private coaching session or lesson. Uh, you can go to my website. There's a link in the description box, and there's a contact form there. Just let me know how I can help you, and we will work it out. Uh, or you can leave a note here at, uh, at the bottom of this video, and we can start from there. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I've had the good fortune to play for, uh, you know, live stream uh, playing for a, a meditation group that had participants throughout the United States and England and the Philippines, um, was able to do a workshop with some graduate music students at a university in Nebraska, and I've worked with private native flute students, um, both beginner and advanced level, um, in New Hampshire and Maryland. Uh, all of this through Zoom without leaving my little space here in Florida. So um, there are many ways to, to help you out, and uh, that's what I want to do. So let me know about it, and the technology makes it easy and uh, makes it quite affordable as well. All right, let's get started on our deep dive. One of the things I see happen over and over again for people who are just uh, starting to learn to play the flute is that once they've figured out how to make a bark or a chirp, they get really, really excited and they want to use it all the time. And they've learned how to make one kind of bark or chirp and they use that one for all musical situations. And so the bark and chirp becomes a, you know, kind of a, uh, a stereotyped part of their sound as though, oh, I'm playing a native flute, I have to put a bark or a chirp at the end of everything. And so, you know, I, I, I might hear a, a really lovely, uh, gentle little ending phrase and there'll still be that same kind of hammered bark on it. Yeah, okay, I, I get it. You know how to make a bark, but you also just ruined that, <laughs> that lovely moment that, the, that you had prepared. So one thing we want to think about a little bit is that we don't have to use barks all the time. Uh, in fact, it will kind of make them more special when they do happen if we don't use them all the time. Here's the end of a song of mine uh, called Raven's Wing. You can hear the entire track if you want to uh, on my disc, River and Circle. It's right here on YouTube Music, and uh, some of it is available on my music videos playlist here as well, so you can check that out. Um, it's a very, very gentle ending, and uh, you're not hearing it in context. And again, there, there, no, if I never use any effects on the flute here when I'm doing these videos, so it's just raw flute sound coming through, not even any EQing. Uh, but the end of this piece is a very, very gentle ending, and it doesn't really need a bark at all. So you probably noticed that for that last couple of phrases, I didn't even use any vibrato at all. It was just very, very simple straight tone. And I just stopped the air at the end of the last note with my diaphragm, and, and that was it. It didn't really need a bark, right? Uh, so one way you can bring some simple variety to your playing is just choose carefully. Listen to what you're doing and only use a bark when it's really needed musically. Now, you probably also noticed that I, there were some places where I did do barks, some places where I ended a phrase with kind of crying breath where the sound kind of fell away. There are all kinds of ways of ending phrases and all kinds of ways of doing barks and chirps, right? Let's go back to our idea of the, uh, the Allen wrench to fix our bicycle, and I actually have one here, okay? Right. So, so sometimes when I hear people playing it, you know, they use barks and chirps as though they only have one Allen key available to them. Yeah. What I'd like for you to do is grab your flute and I'd like for you to try this. I'd like for you to just uh, do a little something to get yourself to the bottom note, get down to the fundamental on your flute. And then I'd like for you to make the strongest bark 
that you can possibly make at the end of the note. I mean, just really, you know, punch that thing with your diaphragm, right? And we're going we're gonna to call that our strongest possible bark, right? You got that? Happy with it? Okay. Now, let's go to the other end. Let's do the same thing. Walk down to that bottom note, and what I want you to do this time is just do the slightest little push with your diaphragm, right? See, see what is the most gentle bark you can make. Just barely there at all, right? So now in our little toolkit, we have our strongest possible bark. We have our gentlest possible bark. Now, once you've got those nailed down and figured out a little bit, then what I'd like for you to do is start seeing how many gradations you can fill in between your strongest bark and your most gentle bark, right? So that eventually you have a whole range of barks and chirps that you can use. Now, even if you've done that, right, just those two things, listen carefully about when to use and when not to use a bark or a chirp, and found ways to vary the strength of the bark and chirp that you're using depending on the musical situation, you've already greatly expanded your expressive power, right? You know, now have tools that will work in a lot of different musical situations and bring a lot of added expressivity to your playing. But we're not done yet. Let's keep deep diving. All right, barks and chirps are most often used at the ends of notes and phrases, but they don't have to be used just that way, right? Let's think about other ways we can place barks and chirps now. Let's think if we can find a way to put a bark at the beginning of a note instead of at the end. Now, for this, we're going to kind of have to reverse the process, right? Remember that uh, when we were putting one at the end of a note, we've, got, we've reached the end of our, our phrase, we're sustaining our note, and then we pop with our diaphragm and with our fingers and stop the air immediately. Right? To put a bark at the beginning of a note, we're going to have to reverse that process. All right? So now I'm trying to start the sound with a pop. And then instead of stopping the sound right away, I want to get to a steady state breathing that's just right for playing, regular playing. So it's going to be pop and then sustain. And that will take a little getting used to. Pop and then sustain. Our fingers also have to do something different. Instead of starting on the flute and releasing like they do at the end of a, of, a, of a tune, we're going to start with the fingers off the flute. And when I, when, I, when I hit with my diaphragm, my fingers are going to come down right away, right? And they're going to stay there. So it's completely opposite. Instead of starting on the flute and leaving, and uh, they're going to start it off the flute, get to those finger holes, and then hang on because, you know, we're going to continue playing. So it's going to sound like this, and I'm going to stand up here so that you can see what my, my fingers are doing to get the sound started. You got that? Look one more time. Listen carefully. Now, I usually find it helpful to start the sound with the help of my tongue. And again, you have a lot of variation about how explosive you want the tonguing to be. It can be a more gentle tonguing, or it can be a really you know, hard tonguing if you want it to be, and you'll get extra overblow if you use a, a, a hard tonguing on that. But then you really want to get that air right settled down, right? If, if you let the air stay explosive, you're going to overblow the note that you're, that you're trying to uh, add the bark to. So what we're wanting to do is hit it, and then steady state. Got it? Okay. Well, if we can put a bark at the end of a, of a note, and at the beginning of a note, why not in the middle of a note? All right, so now, technique is slightly different again. We're sustaining breath, sustaining breath, and every now and then, pop, 
with the diaphragm and back to the sustaining breath, hop with the diaphragm and back to the sustaining breath. And a similar thing is going on with our fingers, right? As, as we hit with the diaphragm, the fingers go up and down again really, really quickly, right? And that allows us to hear a bark within a note, but then we come right back to the note, right? So it sounds like this, and then I'll get up close to you see what my fingers are doing. All right, now a couple of times there you heard that the, the, the bottom note tried to overblow, and that's because I didn't get off the breath quickly enough. I didn't get back down to here. I was worrying more about what this looked like to you than what it sounded like at that point. All right, but let me get up here close so that you can see the fingers. I'll see if I can control it a little bit better this time. And uh, what, what we should hear is a sustained note with some barks added to it. All right, here we go. And then I put one at the end as well, okay? So now we are starting to build up a pretty good toolkit here, right? We're listening carefully about when and when not to use barks. We've developed a lot of different strengths of barks. And now we have technique that will allow us to put a bark at the beginning of a note, at the end of a note, or within a note. Right now, you may want to go back and review this technique a little bit for different placements within the note because the, the technique is slightly different whether you're doing it at the end, at the beginning, or in the middle, and you want to, to make sure about that. So if, if you need to go back and review, do that, and then we're still not done. We're going to deep dive just a little bit more yet. All right, I have just a couple more things to show you, and then we'll wrap things up. But before I do that, I want to let you know about some other stuff I've been up to that you might be interested in. Uh, recently, I did uh, an interview with a really cool um, new music blog called No Dead Guys, and uh, I'll add a link to that in the description box so you can go check that out. It was a written interview. They sent me some questions, and I wrote answers to them. Uh, I also have a blog at my website, uh, and my most recent post is about a time that I played Native American flute for a papal mass, of all things, and about another time that I refused to play for a papal mass. So you can go check that out if you want to at my website. Again, there'll be a link in the description box below. Uh, then finally, a very good friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dawn Avery, has a new project out. Dawn and I have known each other for years. We've worked on each other's projects, played together, uh, done uh, all kinds of music making together. And uh, she has a project she's been working on for years now called the North American Indian Cello Project, because one of the many wonderful things Dawn does is play cello. So she asked a lot of uh, Native American composers, including me, to write music for her to play on her cello. And the project is, is finally completed. All the recordings are done. And she is rolling it out on Bandcamp this month. So as soon as there is a link for my piece there, I'll put it in the description box below. But in the meantime, you can visit her website, dawnavery.com, and see all the cool things she is doing. Uh, recently, I, I uploaded a track that Dawn and I did together. Uh, it's called The Between Time, and you can find the art vid of it in my music videos playlist. I'll, I'll try to get a link up here that you can click on depending on what device uh, that you're on. It's a free improv track, so it's a duo track, Native Flute and Cello, that Dawn and I did in the studio together. And I think you'll enjoy it. I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy her, uh, her cello playing. So you can check that out, too, when you have a chance. All right, just a couple more things that are related to barks and chirps that you can try with your flutes. Grab your medium A, and here we go. Um, <clears throat> some of you have been playing for a while may not even think of these things as barks and chirps, but for, for me, they kind of grew out of, of looking for ways to expand my, my bark and chirp options, and so I think of them that way, uh, even though they don't sound a whole lot like a, a, a normal bark or chirp. Uh, the first one kind of comes out of the idea of, of, you know, sometimes I'll get to the end of a phrase and instead of a bark or a chirp, I'll just want to let the air kind of fall away. Well, 
well, what would happen if I were to try that with the bark? All right, so here I'm going to end a, end a note with a bark, but instead of doing what we've been talking about, go steady state and then pop and then stop the air right away, I'm going to release the fingers and just give the gentlest little push with my diaphragm and let, then instead of stopping the air abruptly, I'm going to let the air fall away, just like I would if I were using a sighing or a crying breath at the, uh, at the end of a phrase. It sounds like this. And you get all these lovely little high whistle tones when you do that. So I'm, I'm going to, again, I'm going to get up close so you can see what my fingers are doing. They're just acting like a regular bark at the end of a phrase. The, I'm going to pull the top two fingers off and, uh, and leave them off. But it's my breath that's different now. Instead of stopping the breath abruptly, just a gentle push with the diaphragm and then let the breath fall away. And for some songs, that's exactly the right way to end. Now, other songs uh, are, are really high energy at the end. Sometimes you want something that just sounds a little spectacular to, to end things. So this is, this is a sound that I've developed to, to help do that. And I think of it as a screech. It's, all, it's almost like hearing a, a bird screeching someplace. So again, it's a little bit more sustained than a usual bark. And the finger technique is a little bit different. So let me let you, let, let you hear it first, and then I'll show you what my fingers are actually doing. So you can hear how the sound is kind of and then the sound stops abruptly. So what's happening here is instead of hitting with my diaphragm, I'm, I'm waiting to hit with that. I'm trying to make that screech sound and then stopping the sound really abruptly with my diaphragm and my tongue. And what my fingers are doing is instead of pulling off abruptly like this, they're rolling off or sliding off the holes. And what that does is, is cause the pitch to do this, all right? So I'm sustaining the breath through that and then stopping everything abruptly with my diaphragm and my tongue. All right, watch my fingers while I do it again. All right, now you could see how my fingers were, were not pulling up abruptly. They were, they were kind of sliding off the finger holes. And while I was doing that, I was actually increasing the breath to give that even more of a swooping, screeching kind of sound. And then the breath is shut down abruptly with diaphragm and tongue, and that, that ends the sound, all right? So for, a, you know, kind of a spectacular ending piece, if you need that, you know, that final gesture to kind of put it over the top, yeah, maybe try that a time or two and see what happens. All right, so if you get all of these techniques under control, then your, your tool bag of barks and chirps has really expanded considerably. And you have a lot of options that you can explore uh, for bringing more musical variety uh, to your playing. And that's what we all want to do. We want our music to be as expressive as possible. Uh, we don't want it to sound the same all the time. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've heard you know, too, too many people that'll be all excited. Oh, I've, I've written 200 Native American flute songs and then I'll hear them play for a while and I'll be like, gee, sorry, brother, you've actually uh, not written 200 Native flute songs. You've written one Native flute song 200 times. So stick around, keep coming back for more of these videos and we'll look for other ways to bring more expressive power to our playing. Uh, there's too much stereotyped native flute playing going on out there, right? Stereotypes are limitations. Our flutes are as expressive and variable as any other musical instrument on the planet, but only if you're willing to get beyond the stereotypes and deep dive and explore the full capabilities of the instrument. It's a wonderful, wonderful instrument with, uh, I mean, I, I, I wake up every day and wonder what it's going to teach me next. I'm, I feel like I'm nowhere near finding all of the things that this wonderful, wonderful instrument can do. 
All right, so come along with me for the ride and we'll keep exploring. Leave any comments or questions that you have in the uh, notes below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And again, if you feel like you need a little extra help on things, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here to help you out. Uh, we're all on this journey together. We can all help each other. All right, thanks a lot for sticking this out to the end and I will look forward to seeing you next time.